copyright disclaimer under the section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976, allowances made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by a copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing nonprofit educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. Salam alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. Bismillah, wa salatu wa salam, Rasulullah, wa ba'd. In the name of Allah, and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his last and final messenger, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As to what follows, family, friends, foes, haters, and haters, walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, I'm Adam. Welcome back to the features. <clears throat> give me the thumbs up, give me, uh, what you call it, subscribe, like, share, hit me up on Patreon if you're on this. Today's topic, I waited to get onto this, today's topic. I wasn't sure if I wanted to make like a separate video or do this live because it's a very, very, very sensitive topic. Very sensitive and a very important topic, especially for those who are Easterners. If you're from the East, you need to know this topic I'm talking about right now, more so than the Westerners, more so, especially the black Westerners, because we understand this for the most part. Right? But the Easterners, they, they don't really understand this particular thing I'm about to talk about right now. And it shows, by, by the way, that uh, the brothers from the East act and the certain things that they, that they put out on their social media. So like, subscribe, share, hit me up on Patreon. As you know, we got a lot of haters up in here, so let's get right into it, inshallah. So before uh, I begin... I want to start by saying I want to send my highest condolences to the family that was brutally murdered in in London, Ontario by that white supremacist. And I don't want this particular life to be misconstrued because I love Canada. I love my country. Um, you know, I have obviously I have lots of love for the Muslims at large. <laughs> right. And I don't want this to be taken the wrong way. Right, so make sure you share this. Make sure you share this because this is important. However, this is so important that I thought it's it's and nobody's covered this. As far as I know, nobody has covered this. And it's so important. And I don't want to see like I seem like I'm presumptuous against any other group. But this has to be addressed. So bismillah. Family. We are at war. And the reality is most of us are not acting appropriately for war, largely because of your so-called Islamic organizations. And this can be, we can use the London terror attacks as a case study for the inappropriate behavior of your Islamic organizations in this attack. Now, we hope that the family, uh, you know, gets genital for those and Allah accepts their shuhada for that brutal murder. And we hope that Allah forgives them for their sins and accepts their good deeds. And we hope this, like a sincere hoping for this. However, I don't want to get so much into the action of that white supremacist so much. What I want you to understand, no, London, Ontario. It's happened in London, Ontario. What I want you guys to understand is the behavior of some of your Islamic organizations when these things happen is completely inappropriate. And they are not helping the situation at all. What do you mean, Bilal? You see, most of the leaders of these organizations are fl fleeing their own countries 
because the enemy has destroyed them. So they leave their countries, their own countries, and they come to the countries of the enemy, demanding their rights from the enemy. So not only do you look crazy, but you look like food. Because you don't even have the wherewithal to call the enemy who the enemy is, and that's an enemy. You don't have the wherewithal or the foresight or the, the bravery to do that. Rather, you come to the West and you participate in the systems, the education, and the politics of the enemy. You feel me? So instead of being brave enough to stand directly in the face of the enemy, what you end up doing is pandering towards them. And the vast majority of these Islamic organizations, that's exactly what they do. That's exactly what they do. Fruitless pandering. So the enemy has a long history of breaking treaties, genocide, uh, making war without action, declaring war. And those who study the art of war and subversion tactics, they understand that the highest, and I want you guys to understand this, the highest form of warfare is to not fight at all. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi The highest form of warfare is to not fight at all. Rather, it is to subvert uh, anything of value in the countries of your enemy. And that means the Muslim countries. The enemy knows that you are the enemy. They understand that. They act according towards that. And all their behaviors is built upon treating you as the enemy. So, since the highest form of warfare is to not fight at all, then what is the goal of this? The, rather, it is to subvert anything of value in the country of your enemy, that is you, to such time that the perception of you of, of the perception to you of your enemy is so muddled and confused that you don't even perceive the enemy as your enemy. Ya Rab. And that your that, that the systems of your enemy and the civilization and the ambitions and the politics and the culture of your enemy look to you as an alternative. Are you understanding me? Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, like, share, subscribe, hit me up on Patreon. So the way you perceive how the enemy does things, you perceive that as an alternative. This is how your Islamic groups act. They don't perceive the enemy as an enemy. Rather, they practically kiss the ground that they walk on. What you guys under, gotta understand is that media is warfare. Institutions are warfare. And language is important. The way that language is utilized and portrayed to the public is done in an intentional way when it comes to the enemy. So when they refer to you, the Muslims, they refer to you as terrorists. And when they refer to black folk, they refer to black people as uh, criminals. Are you understanding me? But when they refer to themselves, they have a different language that they use. 
They refer to themselves, whenever they do these crimes, they, they refer to themselves as the lone gunman, the, the one who had uh, a personal problems when they're growing up, the one who had psychological problems, maybe he's crazy. They make a million and one excuses for themselves. Are you understanding me? They have all kinds of excuses and soft language for their crimes. And they have all kinds of harsh language for you and your crimes. In the meantime, we are beginning to learn more about Veltman's unhappy teenage years from divorce documents initiated by his mother in 2016 that Global News has obtained. At the time, Nate, one of six children, the eldest along with a twin sister, was described as becoming increasingly difficult and argumentative with his mother, telling her she should stop homeschooling his four younger siblings. He was clearly upset about the split and was constantly attempting to discuss and argue with his mother and called it her fault. In court documents, it stated matters have become so stressful for the applicant that at times she has to lock herself in her bedroom. When Nathaniel was just 16 years of age, he told his parents he would be moving into his own apartment because he didn't want to live with his mother. And at the time, his dad was living in Sarnia, which was not convenient. And for the first time today, we are hearing uh, from Nathaniel Veltman's uh, father directly his father sending a statement to Global News saying he has so much sorrow for the uh, Absol family who as uh, we know are going to be laid to rest on Saturday. I'm going to have more about what we've learned uh, from those court documents about Nathaniel Veltman's past and some of it is quite surprising. Back to you. Did you catch that family? Did you catch that? This is Global News and they're going into the past of this white supremacist terrorist. And what do they say? They already start with the excuses. You know, his parents got divorced. Uh, you know, like uh, he was, he really, he was really upset and traumatized and he changed after his parents divorced and blah, 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 blah. That is how the enemy works. They're already beginning to paint a picture the reason why this white supremacist is a white supremacist is because he was traumatized as a child. You understand? Do you understand? They have a language for themselves that they use that is not for you. How do you know this, Bilal? This style of media that is that is being perpetuated and pushed on society has now crept into the Muslim ranks. So much so that some of your Muslim groups use a certain language to describe black people as well. The, the white terrorist, oh, his parents went through a divorce, he's traumatized, blah, 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 blah. That's how to describe them, okay? Now I'm gonna read to you. This is from a uh, Telegram account, a very popular Telegram account, okay? From one of your very popular Muslim uh, da'is, okay? And I'm not gonna say his name. I'm gonna let you guys guess, okay, who this is. Right? Now listen, listen to what this person says. Okay? I wonder what Dr. Omar thinks about all the Shia practices commemorating the births and deaths of Ahl al-Bayt. I guess people like George Fentanyl Floyd and Makia Stabby Stabby Bryant, who are also both honored at this event, were more worthy of commemoration in his eyes. I want you to guess who said that. This is a, a Muslim saying it. He also writes, Oh, I almost forgot. Simp for fentanyl addicted criminals who obviously died of drug overdose overdoses. Now write in the chat, write in the chat who you think it is and who this person is talking to. Just to show you just to show you the power of language and warfare. Is George Floyd, yes. 
George Floyd. So he's talking about George Floyd, right? He is saying that George Floyd died of a fentanyl overdose, even though there was a trial, there were doctors, witnesses, nobody said that, but he's saying that. This is Daniel Hakikachu. This is Daniel Hakikachu. And a lot of you Easterners eat up everything that he says. And this is not the only thing I have about Daniel Hakikachu. I have so much stuff, right? But I don't want to make this video about him specifically. But it's to show you what language they use for certain people. You understand? For black people, you have to be a drug addicted criminal. Therefore, you deserve to die. You deserve to get choked out and snuffed out by police. For white folks, oh, maybe because he's traumatized because his parents got divorced. So how did the Muslim community react to the slaughter of that family in London, Ontario? They reacted with demanding their rights and demanding the government, meaning the enemy, does something against Islamophobia. And since that family, Rahimahumullah, was slaughtered in the streets, there has been, at another protest in the States, uh, another drive, you know, a, a set of people gotten run over in a protest. At least three people got attacked in Edmonton. And... IIT uh, also had a break-in. Now, I want to read something to you. Remember, this break-in that happened in IIT happened after, after that family was killed. And I want to read to you what the witnesses did, okay? These are Muslims, okay? I'm reading you directly what they said. They said, Myself and Riyadh, my business partner, were at IIT to create a site plan for our graduation ceremonies to be held this weekend. Okay? Listen up. As we were leaving, we observed a white male and a white female. Okay, two Muslim men. What did they observe? A white male and a white female trying to enter the front doors. We watched them from afar, and I went back to ask Brother Farooq the building manager, okay? So now there are three, three Muslim men, okay? Three Muslim men, okay? Okay? Are you, are you with me? Let's do the math. If he knew who they were, at this point, the individuals were trying to enter every other door on the premises. Family. <laughs> Family. At this point, he noticed that they're trying to enter every door on the premises, correct? What did he do? Did he try to stop them? No. There's three of them. Did he confront them? No. What did he do? First thing he does, the first thing he does, I called 911. I called 911. As I felt these people were not welcome on the property and we felt unsafe, we, three men, three Muslim men, okay? We felt unsafe due to the events in London. Three Muslim men versus one man and one woman felt unsafe. Actually, I was mistaken. According to the reports, there are people inside the masjid. So it was definitely more than three men. I mean, the chair of the Institute's board said a handful of people in the building were inside at the time of today's incident. The gates were left open for a delivery. So this is the man at the ministry. And as you can see, he's not that big of a dude. And you'll see the, the woman as well going into the patio wagon as well. So you have the man, you have the woman. And all these people in the ministry couldn't chase them away or anything. They had to call the police and they put this on TV. And you also see the police at the end protecting the people praying. So this is a very big problem because on one hand, you're inviting white supremacists 
to come and beat you up or attack you or whatever because they see that you're weak and on the other hand you're fighting you're inviting the other white supremacists to surveil you at your own masjid mm. 